And good morning, good afternoon, good evening once again, and welcome to another installment of AJS 230, the police function at Cochise College. This week we're going to take a look at police ethics and police deviance, and this will correlate to Chapter 8 in your reading assignment. So with that, we're going to get started. One of the problems with police deviance is that police tend to, or rather the community tends to lose trust of its police officers. And this is what this photograph typically represents. Now, if you'll notice, there are some familiar looking faces in the foreground. You'll notice the Reverend Al Sharpton, who is leading this march in, the, in New York. And what they're pro protesting, rather, is, is the uh, stop and frisk policy of the New York City police. Now, Sharpton and his followers in this particular march believe that, that stop and frisk policing is actually part of racial profiling, which, which again is a corrupt practice in their opinion, of course. But the reality is there's a lot more to it. The problem is if the community loses trust in the police, then the police are not going to be able to function. As we've learned in previous sections, it is up to the people, if not their elected representatives, to determine how much money the police get. And so their funding could be cut. They may not necessarily receive information from the community, or the community may engage, as you see in this photograph here, in open rebellion against the police. And this creates a number of problems. So what we're going to talk about is, of course, police in the United States have a great deal of authority and a, and a great deal of latitude or discretion when they use that authority. When those two particular situations combine, we often have a situation of uh, where corruption may occur. If not corruption, there's also brutality. We're, and our authors seem to believe that brutality is a part of just cause or noble cause corruption, which we'll talk about later on in this presentation. Now, all this makes for great media coverage, and, and of course, there's been lots of TV and books and so forth, some of, some of which has varying levels of, shall we say, fiction. And the reason for all this is because the majority of police officers in the United States are actually quite ethical people. However, because this is so far out of the norm that the media will jump on on any any particular story whatsoever regarding police corruption and they'll exploit it because they know it makes for good reading and high ratings. With that said, we're going to shift our focus to ethics, and we're going to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at Aristotle and what he wrote about ethics. And there's a number of things we can take from Aristotle that would be useful for law enforcement. Imagine a person always knows what to say, who can diffuse a tense situation, deliver tough news gracefully, is confident without being arrogant, brave but not reckless, generous but never extravagant. This is the type of person that everybody wants to be around and to be like, someone who seems to have mastered the art of being a person. This may sound like an impossible feat, but Aristotle believed that while rare, these people do exist, and they are what we should all aspire to be virtuous. And there's a whole moral theory based on this idea of virtue. But unlike most of the moral theories we've discussed, virtue theory doesn't spend a lot of time telling you what to do. There's no categorical imperative or principle of utility. Instead, virtue theory is all about character. Rather than saying, follow these rules so that you can be a good person, Aristotle and other virtue theorists reasoned that if we can just focus on being good people, the right actions will follow effortlessly. Become a good person, and you will do good things. No rule book needed. So why should you become a virtuous person? Because eudaimonia. 
Virtue theory reflects the ancient assumption that humans have a fixed nature, an essence, and that the way we flourish is by adhering to that nature. Aristotle described this in terms of what he called proper functioning. Everything has a function, and a thing is good to the extent that it fulfills its function, and bad to the extent that it doesn't. This is easy to see in objects created by humans. A function of a knife is to cut, so a dull knife is a bad knife. And a function of a flower is to grow and reproduce, so a flower that doesn't grow is just bad at being a flower. And the same goes for humans. We're animals, so all the stuff that would indicate proper functioning for an animal holds true for us as well. We need to grow and be healthy and fertile. But we're also the rational animal and a social animal, so our function also involves using reason and getting along with our pack. Now you might notice that some of this sounds a lot like parts of natural law theory, Aquinas' theory that God made us with the tools we need to know what's good. Well, Aristotle had a strong influence on Thomas Aquinas, so part of Aristotle's thoughts on virtue theory ended up in natural law theory. But for Aristotle, this isn't about God's plan, it's just about nature. Aristotle argued that nature has built into us the desire to be virtuous, in the same way that acorns are built with a drive to become oak trees. But but what exactly does it mean to be virtuous? Aristotle said that having virtue just means doing the right thing at the right time, in the right way, in the right amount, toward the right people. Which sort of sounds like Aristotle saying exactly nothing. I mean, how vague can you be? But according to Aristotle, there's no need to be specific because if you're virtuous, you know what to do all the time. You know how to handle yourself and how to get along with others. You have good judgment. You can read a room and you know what's right and when. Aristotle understood virtue as a set of robust character traits that once developed will lead to predictably good behavior. You can think of virtue as the midpoint between two extremes, which Aristotle called vices. Virtue is just the right amount, the sweet spot between the extreme of excess and the extreme of deficiency. And this sweet spot is known as the golden mean. So let's take a look at some particular virtues, starting with courage. What is courage? To take a closer look at this, let's head to the thought bubble for some flash philosophy. Walking home from a movie, you see a person being mugged. What is the courageous action for you to take? Your impulse might be to say that a courageous person would run over there and stop the mugging because courage means putting yourself in harm's way for a good cause, right? Well, no. A virtuous person, in the Aristotelian sense, would first take stock of the situation. If you size up the mugger and have a good reason to believe that you could safely intervene, then that's probably the courageous choice. But if you assess the situation and recognize that intervention is likely to mean that both you and the victim would be in danger, the courageous choice is not to intervene, but to call for help instead. According to Aristotle, Courage is the midpoint between the extremes of cowardice and recklessness. Cowardice is a deficiency of courage, while recklessness is an excess of courage, and both are bad. Aristotle said that you definitely can have too much of a good thing. So being courageous doesn't mean rushing headlong into danger. A courageous person will assess the situation, they'll know their own abilities, and they'll take action that is right in the particular situation. Part of having courage, he argued, is being able to recognize when, rather than stepping in, you need to find an authority who can handle a situation that's too big for you to tackle alone. Basically, courage is finding the right way to act. And a lot of the time, but not all of the time, that means doing a thing that you know you're capable of, even if doing it scares the pains off of you. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Aristotle thought all virtue works like this. The right action is always a midpoint between extremes. So there is no all or nothing in this theory, even honesty. In this view, honesty is the perfect midpoint between brutal honesty and failing to say things that need to be said. Like, no one needs to be told that they have a big zit on their face. They already know. The virtue of honesty means knowing what needs to be put out there and what you should keep quiet about. And it also means knowing how to deliver hard truths gracefully, how to break bad news gently, or to offer criticism in a way that's constructive rather than soul-crushing. The virtue of generosity works the same way. It avoids the obvious vice of stinginess, but also doesn't give too much. It's not generous to give drugs to an addict, or to buy a round of drinks for everyone in the bar when you need that money for rent. The right amount of generosity means giving when you have it to those who need it. it it can mean having the disposition to give just for the heck of it, but it also means realizing when you can't or shouldn't give. So now you can see why Aristotle's definition of virtue was totally vague. Where that golden mean is depends on the situation. But if you have to figure out what virtue is in every situation, how could you possibly ever learn to be virtuous? Aristotle thought there was a lot that you could learn from books, but how to be a good person is not one of them. He said that virtue is a skill, 
a way of living, and that's something that can only really be learned through experience. Virtue is a kind of knowledge that he called a practical wisdom. You might think of it as kind of like street smarts. And the thing about street smarts is that you gotta learn them on the streets. But the good news is, you don't have to do it alone. Aristotle said your character is developed through habituation. If you do a virtuous thing over and over again, eventually it will become part of your character. But the way you know what the right thing to do is in the first place is by finding someone who already knows and emulating them. These people who already possess virtue are moral exemplars. And according to this theory, we are built with the ability to recognize them and the desire to emulate them. So you learn virtue by watching it and then doing it. In the beginning, it'll be hard and maybe it'll feel fake because you're just copying some someone who's better than you at being a good person. But over time, these actions will become an ingrained part of your character. And eventually, it becomes that robust trait that Aristotle was talking about. It'll just manifest every time you need it. That's when you know you have virtue, fully realized. It becomes effortless. Okay, but why? What's your motivation? What if you have no desire to beat the guy who always says the right thing, or the lady who always finds the courage when it's needed? Virtue theory says that you should become virtuous because if you are, then you can attain the pinnacle of humanity. It allows you to achieve what's known as eudaimonia. This is a cool Greek word that doesn't have a simple English translation. You might say it means a life well lived. It's sometimes translated as human flourishing. And a life of eudaimonia is a life of striving. It's a life of pushing yourself to your limits and finding success. A eudaimonistic life would be full of the happiness that comes from achieving something really difficult rather than just having it handed to you. But choosing to live a eudaimonistic life means that you're never done improving. You're never to a point where you can just coast. You're constantly setting new goals and working to develop new muscles. Choosing to live life in this way also means you'll face disappointments and failures. Eudaimonia doesn't mean a life of cupcakes and rainbows. It means the sweet pleasure of sinking into bed at the end of an absolutely exhausting day. It's the satisfaction of knowing you've accomplished a lot and that you've pushed yourself to be the very best person you could be. This is morality for Aristotle. It's being the best person you can be, honing your strengths while working on your weaknesses. And for Aristotle, the kind of person who lives like this is the kind of person who will do good things. Today we learned about virtue theory. We studied the golden mean and how it exists as a midpoint between the vices of excess and deficiency. We talked about moral exemplars and the life of eudaimonia that comes with virtuousness. Next time, we're going to consider a tricky little problem in ethics known as moral luck. Crash Chris and actually, we're not going to consider moral luck. Instead, we're going to continue our some applied ethics. Now, we talk a lot about ethics, and our authors talk a lot about ethics in, in the textbook, but personally, from, at least based on my experience, it is far better for a police officer to be virtuous than, than ethical. Because if you look at policing, that's really what we're trying to do here. Now, let's take a look at some applications of ethics. Now, we, we've already seen that ethics is a study of what, what constitutes good or bad conduct. Well, that's all well and good, but as we've seen, a more successful police officer would be, rather be virtuous than ethical. Of course, if you're a virtuous person, then ethics will come by itself. Having said that, there's also some We've talked a lot about basic ethics in the previous slide, but now let's look at some applied ethics. Some of the applied ethics involve things such as making ethical standards. Oftentimes these ethical standards will show up in the oath of office for a police officer and the law enforcement code of ethics, both of which can be found on the Arizona Post website if you, if you look there. But with that said, those are often formal ethical standards. And the formal ethical standards are about as good as the administration's ability or inability to enforce them. When, when the administration says one thing and does another, it allows for things such as an informal code of conduct. And this is the code of conduct that police officers have amongst themselves. And in many departments, this, this may not necessarily be a problem. But in some departments, especially those departments, 
where the administration has a high tolerance for unethical behavior, then we could end up with a problem. Now that we just discussed uh, ethics just a little bit, let's take a look at the dilemma that, that law and order often faces. Now, police officers have to always balance the interests of law versus order. And what that often means is, is, that, is that the letter of the law requires that there's a certain level of enforcement. However, the situation may require that this level of enforcement be sometimes not enforced. Of course, this gets right back to Aristotle and his ethical uh, eudaimonia, or, or for being a virtual, virtuous person. In other words, at some point, a police officer has to make a decision as to whether or not he should enforce this, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. And unfortunately, this is a dilemma that police have to often face every single day. And it's not always an easy decision to make. Now, with the, uh, the decision to not enforce law, this often, or I should say occasionally results in in a uh, what, what our authors like to call a slippery slope to corruption. In other words, if a police officer continually has to make these enforce or non enforce decisions, eventually he may take the path of least resistance and just not enforce anything. But we mustn't confuse corruption with Aristotle's uh, idea of being of being virtuous. Being virtuous, if you remember from our, our video, is doing the right thing at the right time to the right people, Where, whereby corruption is doing whatever is easy or whatever gets the gets the appointed job done without necessarily following the rules. And there's a big difference between the two. It may sound the same, but it isn't. So with that said, let's take a look at what happens when corruption is not controlled. What happens is if, if the police do not control themselves, then the public is going to step in and do it, do it themselves. And this is probably one of the greatest reasons why, why police administration should not accept a great deal of corruption from its officers. Because at that point, if the department cannot police itself, then you're going to have civilians police the, the department for them. And oftentimes these people may have, may have the best of intentions, but have absolutely no idea what goes on in law enforcement. And this is the exact situation that what we had in the 1960s and 70s. There were numerous national commissions that occurred actually, which actually stretched as far back as, as the 20s. Probably the, the most egregious example, or perhaps the most notorious example of such commissions, is the Knapp Commission. And the Knapp Commission was called because, because this commission was reviewing police corruption at the New York City Police Department, where it was apparently so corrupt that, that the majority of at least according to testimony, the majority of detectives that worked in at the New York City Police Department were taking bribes. And of course, ultimately, if the citizens don't review, review the police department, the media certainly will. And so, okay, so as I talked about before, if the public doesn't police the police law enforcement, and if law enforcement themselves doesn't police themselves, you'll end up with the media policing law enforcement. And as we've already seen before, the police are a great target for the, for the media in that any sort of corruption by law enforcement is such a 
such a deviation from the norm of every other police department. It gets it gets viewership, it gets ratings, and most depart or most media outlets will just jump on that story. With that said, let's take a look back in time and let's consider one such commission that attempted to police the New York City Police Department. And what you're going to see is the Knapp Commission, probably the, the last large-scale oversight that was done by, or, or rather done to, a major police department. And it seems like we've had a little technical difficulty, so we'll try it one more time. This, according to the Net Commission investigators who filmed it, is a New York City policeman getting paid off, taking bribe money from a man representing a house of prostitution. The patrolman's name is William Phillips. The commission confronted him with the evidence and got him to agree to be an undercover agent. He was also the first witness at this week's public hearings. It wasn't just him, he said, it was everybody. What percentage of the plainclothesmen assigned to the division, to the 6th Division at that time, do you feel participated in the past? Everyone, to my knowledge. Everyone? Everyone. And what do you base that on? Well, I base it on my own uh, experience and working in different areas in the city and coming in contact with the new plainclothesmen. I never knew a plainclothesman yet that was in plainclothes for more than two months that wasn't on the pad. Because if a, if a man is assigned to plain clothes and he's there for two or three months and he sees what's going on and he doesn't want to become part of the system, he's usually transferred out. New York's police commissioner, Patrick Murphy, had cooperated with the NAP Commission in letting them use Phillips. But he did not like the impression the patrolman was making at the hearing. A very long story is being told by a corrupt policeman, a man who admits to a pattern of corruption over a long number of years in this department. A man who was caught in the commission of a very serious crime and who obviously now is a man on the hook, squirming, squirming to get the best possible deal for himself. But as the week wore on, Phillips, the rogue cop, as Murphy called him, kept talking implicating his fellow policemen in the slimy world of bagmen, pimps, and pushers. Now, do you recall an incident involving a prostitution and bookmaking operation? Uh, this informant gave us information about a bookmaking operation in Midtown. And he gave us the location of the uh, bookmaking records in the apartment. He had been in there. Uh, we got into the apartment, and we also discovered that this individual had two girls working in the apartment with We found all the bookmaking records. Uh, and he asked us if we could make a contract with us. When you say two girls working in the apartment, what do you mean? There were two prostitutes in the apartment, which we didn't, we didn't know about at the time we went in. And uh, we gave him a figure of $3,000, which $1,500 were paid. One woman, Madam X, she's called, says she paid Officer Phillips for protection of her brothel on Manhattan's east side and got arrested anyway. She's Javiera Hollander, 28 years old, born in Holland. She spoke with correspondent Chris Borgen at WCBS-TV. Now, here, here you involve somebody with having to pay off a police officer. Did that come as a shock to you that a police officer would be coming to you for money? No, uh, actually... I've heard many times that police officers are just as crooked as real crooks, but I still sympathize with them because I realize that many organizations or bars or restaurants or, or gambling places could not exist without payoffs and without a little bit of protection. Otherwise, people would get busted and raided time after time after time. So I think I'm pretty lenient is that the word? towards payoffs in a way because everybody's got to make Now, that last person that was talking uh, was Xavier Hollander, who later went on to write the bestseller, The Happy Hooker. 
in that particular novel, well, actually it was a novel, more of an autobiography, she described the business of prostitution, and part of that business involved payoffs. Now, a lot of people would like to think that that uh, the Knapp Commission and some of the things that occurred was just in New York. It's just a New York problem. The problem is, is that as the media gets a hold of these incidents and they they sensationalize them, we end up with a situation where everybody is compared to the same values as the as the New York City police officers. So with that, let's take a look at some definitions. Our authors define police corruption, and of course there's many different definitions, as someone who is acting in their official capacity and re receives something of value for doing something or not doing something. And this could be either taking enforcement action or not taking enforcement action against certain people. Now some examples of police corruption and some of these some of these are actually long after the the uh, NAP Commission. Probably the worst of itself in recent history history has been the Rampart scandal. In fact, the Rampart scandal is going to be part of your uh, exercise for the week. So I'm so rather than discussing the Rampart scandal in depth, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait till you have had a chance to review that information and then and then write a, an appropriate response. Now, with that said. As I mentioned before, the fish often stinks from the head down. And what that means is, is that corruption is not just a rank and file thing. Corruption has actually taken some very, very high offices in some very large, large plate or large uh, organizations, some of which are listed here. Bernie Carrick, for example, former New York City Police Commissioner, uh, was involved in a scandal involving uh, undocumented laborers. Paul Tanaka is the, Lo the Los Angeles sheriff or undersheriff. He's, he has just been uh, sent to prison for his role in an obstruction of justice scandal. Uh, Lee Baca was also named in that scandal and he's had, he's had to find himself uh, on the wrong end of, of a court judgment. Then there's, a, uh, there's an undersheriff in Ingham County who had engaged in the business of fixing tickets for her friends. And as I mentioned before, it doesn't necessarily end with with those with municipal agencies or county agencies. What you're about to see here is the arrest of FBI Special Agent Robert Hansen. Now the audio is largely muted, so I'm gonna to try to I'm gonna to try to narrate as best I can here. Now, currently you see Robert Hansen on the surveillance video, and the, of course the audio was shut down. Now you'll notice he's being arrested by an FBI hostage rescue team. Special Agent Hansen was involved in spying for Russia back in the 80s. Well, back then it was known as the Soviet Union. And Robert Hansen was taking money from the Soviets to provide information that was classified from the FBI and other internal security and intelligence agencies. And as a result, there were a number of intelligence assets that were overseas that, that suddenly found themselves dead. Quite frankly, if it, it happens at the FBI, it happens at just about every law enforcement agency there is. And there is no agency that's immune. Every agency has had has had uh, agents or officers go bad. What prevents this from happening is the department or rather the administration's response to that. And in our next segment, we're going to talk a little more 
about some of the reasons for corruption and why it happens. Now we talked a little bit about some reasons for police corruption. Now there's individual officer explanations for police corruption. Now in the case of Special Agent Robert Hansen, his case has been written up in a number of different intelligence and internal security documents. And the reasons that he offers for, for becoming corrupt is that he want, he basically wanted money. He was greedy. He just wanted money. That may be one individual officer explanation. And these individual officer explanations are as varied as the officers themselves. Sometimes officers find themselves in the position where they owe a lot of money to a lot of people. There's a lot of gambling debts. Or as, as a field training officer once told me, Kid, watch out for the killer bees. They'll kill your police career. And of course, being the wide-eyed uh, training officer I was, I asked him, what are the killer bees? And the killer bees, uh, this officer refers to our individual officer explanations. Booze, broads, and bucks. And what he meant was, is that officers will often find themselves corrupted with money or women or substance abuse. If an officer gets involved in one of those three situations, they can very easily find themselves corrupted. Some, some causes of police corruption are social, structural in nature. If you have an officer who is working in a, in a affluent suburb, he may decide that he may want some of that for himself. Or if you have an officer who works in a, in a, uh, community that by and large tolerates, if not lives off of uh, corruption, that too can be a reason why officers become corrupt. Same applies to neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods are affluent and officers may want to try to just keep up with the Joneses or some actually live off corruption. Now the nature of, of police work is also cited as a as a reason for police corruption. We've already talked about that dilemma of where officers have to balance uh, doing the right thing versus enforcing the letter of the law. The police organization is, as I mentioned before, is probably one of the greatest reasons for police corruption, and this is, not, you don't have to take my word for it. There are a number of writers that have looked at police corruption and found that if the administration allows corruption or endorses it or engages in it, it's very likely that the officers will engage in corruption too. Last but not least is the police subculture. The subculture may be a reason for corruption or it may be a aggravating factor in that some subcultures, although this is getting rarer and rarer, have as part of their subculture that we stand up for each other, that we don't rat each other out. And that may either cause corruption or it may aggravate it. Now some of the different types and forms of police corruption that are of course there's grass eaters, and grass eaters are people that are passive, are passively corrupt. They'll take it when it happens, they'll accept it when it's offered, but they may not necessarily go out and look for it. Those that are aggressive and seek opportunities to be corrupt are, are often referred to as meat eaters. Now our Author likes to refer to gratuities as a form of corruption. Now, gratuities as a form of corruption is something that's kind of handled a little, that should be handled carefully. 
when I was a younger officer in Detroit, there were certain restaurants that were in the that would engage in the business of providing either reduced cost or free meals. Technically, this is considered a gratuity. However, oftentimes, rather than simply refusing them, the better choice of action, again, getting getting towards Aristotle's virtuous man, is to perhaps accept them when they when they are offered, but make sure that your waitress gets a really good tip afterward. Again, not exactly the letter of the law, but we've had cases where, where, except or where denying the gratuity actually led to more trouble than it was worth. So, gratuities are something that you want to handle carefully. I'm not saying that, I'm not advocating rather that gratuities should be accepted. There are many cases where they should not. But oftentimes, this is merely an expression of gratitude from the particular business owner. And to not accept that gratitude would be tantamount to an unprovoked insult. So, handle the, so these sort of situations often have to be handled with care and caution. Bribes are a different story. Bribes are when someone overtly offers money or some valuable commodity in exchange for either taking action or not taking action. This is something that absolutely cannot be tolerated. Now, of course, there's now the rotten apple theory, of course, has certain parallels to the idea of the fish stinking from the head down. Whereas if there's an indication of corruption, then the entire organization is corrupt. But, and perhaps that's not necessarily the case. It may be that that organization may just accept and tolerate or has a high tolerance for corruption because perhaps the administration's involved too. Another, another possible uh, cause or rather aggravating circumstance of police corruption is the stage is is the moral decline that some writers have mentioned when they talked about uh, society and that how society is becoming becoming morally decrepit or morally declined and therefore our law enforcement is as well well these these are some forms of police corruption but there's another form that's discussed called the noble cause of police corruption. And this is where officers bend the rules in order to obtain a desired result. This is often better known as the Dirty Harry Syndrome. It's usually not done for personal gain, it's, but rather it's discussed as the means justifying the ends. Now, since a lot of folks haven't seen Dirty Harry, I'm going to provide you with an example of some of his work. With that said, Viewer discretion is advised.
Dirty Harry at work. But this is an example of what is often called no cause corruption. And in this scenario, you have an individual who who had kidnapped someone and Harry was trying to get information to do the right thing. In other words, save a kidnapping victim. And as a result, uses illegal means to do that. And if you were to see the following clip in that series, you'd see that it didn't exactly work out so well for him. But with that said, well, noble cause corruption may not necessarily be for, for pecuniary gain. Noble cause corruption, like any other form of corruption, undermines the public's trust in law enforcement. And what happens is, is that, again, people will stop cooperating with police. They'll regard them as being uh, not not people who are operating in the law, in law enforcement's best interest, but rather in their own self-interest. The department then ends up with a ruined reputation, and it becomes very difficult to work in an agency like that. And because of all this, people will again be think that it's okay to to uh, deal with police officers harshly. It'll, it's okay not to give them information. It's okay to attack them. And so you end up with officers that are stressed out. And so a lot of officers, if they have any options whatsoever, they'll leave the department. Some other misconduct is oftentimes drug related. The reason being is that there's money involved. There's, there's lots of money involved. People who are involved in the drug trade often carry large amounts of cash and therefore they oftentimes will find themselves as robbery victims. Now it's been, it's, it has happened where officers have been involved in robbing drug dealers. In fact, in Detroit, the, re, the reason why Police officers nationwide have gone to wearing raid jackets, identifying police officers as they are, is because, and again, this is not a, this is not a account that's been that's been verified or or acknowledged. But apparently, there was a robbery crew that was out robbing drug dealers. They happened to be cops, and so some of the cops were being shot at. Typically, as I mentioned, they involve small groups of officers, and usually it's profit that is the most frequent motive. And I suspect you probably see this in agencies that are not, that are financially unstable. Now, our authors have identified sleeping on duty as another form of police misconduct. Well, it certainly is misconduct because Practically every department has some so, some form of rule or policy or procedure that says you don't sleep on duty. However, the police administration has to accept a certain level of responsibility for this form of, uh, shall we, I wouldn't even call it misconduct. I would just say, I would just refer to it as deviance. And especially when the department either doesn't have or doesn't make the requisite funds necessary to hire enough police officers. And as a result, you end up working your officers for 12 hour shifts. And so what often happens is these officers who are, who are working at night when it's, when it's not very busy will oftentimes hide out and sleep on duty. With that said, this is one of the situations where management has to take responsibility to and hire enough police officers and schedule them appropriately. If they don't, this sort of misconduct will continue. Now, some other forms of police misconduct that have been identified by our authors includes police deception. And this is often taking the form of what some officers have been have called throughout the years as testa lying. Now, as you can probably guess from the term, testa lying means giving false testimony 
or writing up false affidavits. And the base cause is a number of different things. It could be noble cause misconduct, could be covering oneself to prevent uh, much harsher discipline from occurring. It could be even as much as reducing one's workload. Now, again, depending on the department, this may be a reaction to administrative uh, workplace practices, especially in those, those agencies where officers find themselves being overworked. In those particular agencies, officers may choose to ignore clues and write up their reports indicating that no evidence was found. The idea is, of course, to create less work for themselves. So again, this is one of those situations where departments may have to take a little responsibility on their own. Other forms of misconduct, of course, are sex-related, and this is and this can take any one of, diff of many different forms. Some of the forms that I've seen involve people who are, uh, who are stopped on a, on a traffic stop and they're either, they're propositioned or they're just simply told, if you want to get out of this ticket, then you need to perform some kind of sexual act. Now, oftentimes people don't report this. But I'm, but I'm finding that that people are less and less afraid of retaliation from law enforcement, and more likely to report this form of of abuse. Our authors also view domestic violence in in police families, and. They are, our authors speculate that it may be more prevalent than in the general population because chances are the person that responds to the domestic violence incident is going to be somebody from the offender's own department. Now, it, while it may be a hidden problem, and it's certainly in some departments it has, other departments have not have not been so, shall we say, uh, understanding. Again, not my word, somebody else's. Now, our authors would like us to believe that every department handles this sort of thing informally, and really that's not the case. Especially with the Lautenberg Amendment coming out. The Lautenberg Amendment is an amendment to the Gun Control Act of 1968, which states that anybody involved in a, in a domestic assault is not permitted to possess a firearm. Now what that means for law enforcement in the United States is if you have a police officer who's involved in a domestic assault, that person could very much find themselves out of the police business. And so as a result, these situations are not being handled quite so informally as our authors would like us to believe. And the last case that I was personally involved in, not of course as a suspect, involved a detective who was involved in a assault involving his, his spouse and children, or at least that was the allegation. It was not handled informally. In fact, it was, ha it was handled by the prosecutor's office who chose to charge him. As a result, he ended up spending spending time in jail and was decertified as a result. So we're finding that that despite what our authors may say, this sort of thing is is not being tolerated quite as much as they would like us to think. Now with with all the personal misconduct, let's kind of switch our focus to more bias-based policing. 
bias-based policing has always been critical because our country has been founded on, on equal protection under the law and the rule of law as opposed to the rule of men. And bias-based policing does not necessarily coincide with those American values. Now, while there's been a number of accusations that state that police are engaged in racial profiling and therefore the validity of traffic stops or stop and frisk have been, have been questioned. What is not coming out is that there have been a number of studies that that were aimed at, at bias-based policing. And one particular study comes to mind, and this was a study that was done at the Miami-Dade Police Department in, uh, a few years ago, back when I was still in, in the Miami area. And what was found was rather interesting. What was found was that, that at normal speeds, it was almost impossible for a police officer to, to determine the racial status of any driver before he stopped them. And so this often flies in the face of what everybody liked, would like to tell us about bias-based policing. The reality is, it is indeed it difficult, if not impossible, to determine the race of a driver before they're stopped. Now, in the aftermath of 9-11, we're starting to see another uh, group of people who are claiming they're being stopped because they appear Muslim or they appear Middle Eastern. I think that we're, we're going to find out that most of these cases, they are unfounded. But it's like everything else. Why let if the uh, if it doesn't particularly benefit the media, the media is probably not going to report it. Police brutality is is considered another form of unethical police behavior, but it's oftentimes a very complex issue. The reason being, it's so complex is that use of force is oftentimes a necessary part of police work. I've made literally hundreds of arrests in my career. And with one possible exception, nobody has voluntarily allowed themselves to be arrested and placed in jail. Nobody wants to be arrested. No one wants to go to jail. And especially now, especially when the media likes to paint the idea that police are, are an unethical group of people, which is quite frankly not true. We're, off, we're often finding that more and more people are, are more likely to resist, and not only more likely to resist, but also to resist to a greater degree than, than ever before in our recent history. And as I mentioned before, media attention has been largely at fault. Our authors would like us to believe that using force is a slippery slope between the use of judicious force versus uh, police brutality, or, or as some people would call, uh, getting even. Now there are some officers who believe that that Brutality is oftentimes necessary to keep people from attacking police. In other words, the end justifies the means. If you run from the police, uh, the police are going to bring a, a beating with them, to quote Chris, Chris Rock. Now, as a result of all these allegations, we then have body-worn video. And we also tend to have people with their own video cameras wanting to report any interaction between police and the public. So what we are beginning to see is not so much police brutality, but we're also, well, what we're really beginning to see is police underreaction, where they fail to react. So I think the police brutality problem is probably overblown. So what happens to police corruptions? 
on the official end, we end up with investigations, discipline, sometimes termination, and sometimes decertification. Now, I've separated decertification and termination as two, two separate issues. Needless to say, any allegation of misconduct is investigated. It has to be. Why? Because, because an, a department could be sued if they don't. Oftentimes, in large departments, you end up with an internal affairs division, but when, when the public perceives that the officer, that the department isn't doing enough to keep its own house clean, they will appoint people to do it for them. If it becomes bad enough, then you end up with discipline that could be as little as a counseling memorandum to uh, suspension and then ultimately to termination. What often happens in these circumstances is after the allegation is filed, and if it's bad enough, the officer will be placed on administrative leave pending investigation, after which the result could be uh, discipline in the form of, of suspension up to and including termination. If it's bad enough, a report could be filed at at the state agency that that is in charge of police certification and training. And they in turn can decertify police officers. When this often happens, police officers will often move to another state. And this is what and what has re <clears throat> has caused one organization to develop what is called the National Decertification Index. Departments that are part of this index can query it by name and see if a particular individual has been decertified. In fact, our police academy program is, is part of that, of that network, where if someone were to be decertified and move to Arizona, and attempt to become recertified as an open enrollee, we would in turn conduct an investigation of our own and, and we would deny him entry into the police academy. But because of all this movement, we're seeing a movement towards a national decertification index. Now, the NDI is only part of, a, of a preventive action that could be taken by a police department, most of which is most of the prevention occurs during the hiring and screening process where any agency that's in a particular applicant's uh, community is queried for any sort of derogatory information. If it turns out that there's no derogatory information to return, some of the other preventive actions are, of course, a policy and procedure manual, proper training, and early intervention systems. With all of that said, because of all these different actions that have occurred, we're finding that more and more communities are calling for their officers to have body-worn video. One of the things that I have found in my research in body-worn video is that body-worn video will never take the place of proper hiring and screening processes, a well-written policy and procedure manual, and training. If those three items are in place, then any misconduct that an officer may involve, may find themselves in, could be intervened long before it ends up becoming part of a body-worn video situation. So with that said, communities have to be reasonable and realistic when it comes to body-worn video and what they can expect. Now, as I mentioned before, if a department does not adequately police itself or effectively police itself, oftentimes they'll find themselves with citizen oversight being imposed upon them. The idea, of course, is that if, the, if enough citizens perceive that the police cannot police themselves, 
then they will impose a citizen review board or a civilian oversight board to judge the actions of police. Now, there are some departments that put those systems in place before a crisis occurs, but it's usually to more or less placate citizens that believe that police are, are running amok. Whether or not a citizen oversight review board is a good thing or a bad thing, it, re it really te depends because there is no best system. And of course, the reason why there is no best system, system is because you're re what you're doing is you're compromising. You are allowing a, a group of people to have a certain amount of authority in the operation of your department that really know nothing about law enforcement. And so it's, it's basically trying to make the best of a bad situation. This sort of thing, of course, can be, can be uh, prevented if the department is perceived as being fair and operating in a fair manner. But what happens when officers, when departments don't? operate in a fair manner. Aside from civilian review boards, there's a number of other things that can happen too. One of which is police civil and criminal liability. Now, in a number of states, the police are considered part of the government and therefore uh, have a certain amount of of uh, shielding from liability lawsuits, but in other states that's not the case. What basically happens in practically every state is that if it can be shown that there is that there is gross negligence on the part of the police department, they could indeed be successfully sued. On top of that, they can also be be held criminally liable. And there are some, some statutes in, in a number of states, things such as malfeasance of office and so forth, that can be used to criminally prosecute police officers. And of course, there's also an administrative liability, which is often termed uh, servant liability or vicarious liability. In other words, the director, the supervisor, the chief, etc., also incur liability for the actions of their line level officers. In other words, if they fail to supervise them correctly, then the officers could or the administrators can find themselves in as much trouble as the police officers are. But, but we've talked about state liability. Let's shift to federal liability. If you've ever seen the movie Mississippi Burning, it involves certain individuals of a certain southern police department that were engaged along with civilians in murder. And how they did that was they used their authority as police officers and as civilian assistants to, or police agents when they apprehended a group of people and killed them because they were involved in uh, organizing people for voter registration drives. And so what, what you end up with is a violation of, of Section 1983 of the Civil Rights Act. And police officers and departments are are getting sued, if not criminally prosecuted, under Section 1983 because they failed to observe the civil rights of others when they engaged in their misconduct. And so as a result, the, the entire department, from line level up to the chief of police or the sheriff, finds themselves either being criminally prosecuted or civilly prosecuted. And more and more under those circumstances, officers are cutting deals. 
we're no longer seeing that blue wall of silence that people like to talk so much about. We're actually seeing people who are who are talking to federal investigators and people like Under Sheriff Tanaka actually going to prison because they failed to observe the civil rights of others. Now, some of the reasons for suing police are listed here. Excessive force certainly is one. Uh, failure to aid private citizens is, is another. False arrest, negligent care of suspects. Now, but all of these reasons for suing police officers came out of one textbook, and that is Kapler's Critical Issues in Police Civil Liability. And I happen to have a copy of this on my shelf, too. But one of the things we're finding out is there's roughly about 10 or 12 reasons for police to be sued. And most of these can be ameliorated through proper selection and training. And these are, these are things that are just relatively minor. For example, failure to aid private citizens oftentimes involves the denial of first aid care. You would think, and you would, if you looked at police curriculum, you would see that police officers are supposed to be trained in first aid. Now, according to post regulations, they're supposed to receive continuing training in first aid and CPR every two years. Why is it that they're required to have that continuing training? Because police officers are failing to aid private citizens. And this is actually one of the most uh, frequent reasons for suing police officers. Something that simple. And yet departments and officers are not doing it for whatever reason. And so as a result, they get sued. On average, according to Kapler's critical issues, the average department is having to pay out somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a million dollars on these on these forms of lawsuits. So wouldn't it be cheaper just to train your officers? So what happens? As a result of lawsuits, you end up with departments who suddenly decide to be a little more litigation conscious. And therefore, improvements are forced on the rank and file in departments. So you end up with greater discipline. You end up with, with policy changes. And you end up with training, where there's training that is imposed periodically. And the idea of training is, of course, to sh for the department, not so much to make better cops, but for the department to protect itself. What often is hap is going out in these training, the training days or training classes is it shows that department management has done everything they could to prevent a situation from happening. And when it continues to happen, then the department can say, this officer went rogue. It's not our fault. We did everything we could. And so we then end up with a situation where the officer gets the majority of the, of the lawsuit instead of the department. But you also see something else from happening. And this is something we're seeing in body-worn video. And that's when officers become very reluctant to take action because they're afraid they're going to get sued. And in some situations, it may be safer to do nothing from a litigation standpoint than to do something and be sued. All of this, all this misconduct, all this deviance, takes its own emotional toll on police officers. As a result of these lawsuits, these complaints often generate a great deal of media attention because with the police being a government agency, everything they do is a matter of public record. And it and this includes, oftentimes, internal affairs investigations. Once the internal investigation is completed, that too can be a matter of public record, and that too may be accessible by the media. And if it's bad enough, the media is going to find it. 
and the media is going to publish it because, as we all know, bad cops don't happen every day, but they do happen. And when they do, the media is going to make the most of that. When they do, the media will often send a contingent over to the chief's office and ask him to comment about, about the latest misconduct fiasco that their officers are getting into. What many administrators often do is they often answer by saying, no comment. And that could often be the worst thing they could say. Because no comment is often perceived by the citizens as a cover. -up. As a result, because these officers may or may have done something with the best of intentions, but still get sued, these officers often feel abandoned and alone. Why? Because the department is, is very much concerned with avoiding liability and getting out of the, this lawsuit as quickly and as cheaply as they can. And so what oftentimes is that the officer is left hanging on his own. As a result, many of these officers who feel that they've been abandoned by their department after doing their what they per perceive as their best job is they oftentimes will attempt or commit suicide. And there have been a number of occasions in my working career where officers have been accused of misconduct, have been investigated, and during the investigative process decide to end their own lives as a result. Now this pretty much wraps up our discussion of, of police deviance and police misconduct. So to wrap it up or, or to summarize it, ethics is oftentimes a study of what is good or bad conduct. That may be a rather simplistic uh, way of looking at it. I think virtue or the lack of virtue may be a more accurate description. Police corruption has indeed been around for many years and probably for probably been around for as many years as we've had police officers. It's always been a problem. It may always be a problem. If we were to attempt to totally eliminate it, we would, it may not be successful. Because in the words of Chief William H. Parker of the Los Angeles Police, we have a problem in eliminating, eliminating corruption because we're required to recruit for the human race. Just to review, noble cause corruption often refers to those situations where police officers will deviate or bend the rules to attain a desired result. Again, noble cause corruption usually means there's no there's no personal gain or monetary gain. The idea is to get the, re the right result. In other words, the dirty, hairy situation. Now, another problem with police deviance is, of course, the use of force. Use of force is often a necessary part of the job. Because quite frankly, I've never seen somebody who would voluntarily ask to go to jail or want to go to jail. And now we're seeing even more resistance from people. It used to be many people would just simply accept their situation and, and go to jail, but that just doesn't happen anymore. With that said, force must be reasonable and appropriate. Citizen oversight may be demanded by the community, but usually in those situations where the citizens perceive the police can't police themselves. And the last thought I want to leave you with is that only a very small percentage of police are involved in misconduct. The vast majority of officers work hard and are honest in their, in their uh, work. 